Okay. Um, hi. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Sawit, and I'm currently the integration lead at Band Protocol, where I oversee most of the technical integrations and partnerships of our data oracle with various blockchain platforms, um, smart contract platforms, as well as decentralized applications. And today I have with me Sam Bagman Free, CEO of FTX and Alameda Research. Um, Sam, I'm sure you need no introductions, but just for anyone that might not know, um, do you mind telling us a bit more about yourself? Yeah, totally. So, um, uh, so yeah, I'm Sam. I went to uh, MIT, worked on Wall Street for about three and a half years after that at Jane Street Capital trading ETFs. Got into crypto in 2017, um, spent a year trading uh, with Alameda Research. And um, and then late 2018, started, uh, started building out FTX, a global crypto exchange, launched spring 2019. And have also been uh, you know, involved in DeFi to some extent. Awesome. And before we get any further, right, I uh, just want to get, give a huge congratulations on the recent race with ATX, 900 million round with more than 18 million valuation in less than two years. That's needless to say, right? That's really impressive. Thank you. And that um, it's been said that, you know, the funds will be mainly used towards strategic partnerships as well as acquisitions. Could you perhaps expand a bit more on that and the overall direction that you see FTX as a company or as a project going? Totally. And, uh, you know, obviously I want to respect, you know, other companies' privacies and stuff, but uh, we've been uh, obviously growing a lot uh, in terms of volume, but also in terms of scope and product. Um, and I think that there are a, a bunch of strategic initiatives we're looking to accomplish in some of those I think are best done with partners. And I think, you know, one piece of this is, um, is frankly just looking at growing out our user base. Um, you know, we uh, have a lot of volume on the platform, uh, but we're also the latest of the major exchanges to be founded. So we have way less of a, uh, you know, sort of way less of a uh, long tail uh, user base. We have, you know, 2% as many users as, as a few other exchanges do, um, even though we have more volume than some of them. And so, uh, so one piece of this is looking at, uh, you know, companies that have, you know, large loyal user bases, uh, but aren't technology companies at their heart or financial companies and are looking to add, you know, trading services uh, or crypto services, to their product. Um, and so I think that's sort of like one area of potential acquisitions. Um, you know, I think another one is I, there are some cases where for regulatory purposes, you know, especially licensing. Um, it, it, it can be appropriate, not in all cases. Um, and, uh, you know, some cases where the products just fit together uh, very well, especially if they've built out a lot of non-crypto pieces. Um, and so I, I think that's sort of, you know, those are the biggest areas that we're looking at um, from sort of an acquisition perspective. Um, and, and I do think that that's sort of one of the biggest potential uses of the funds. I see. And now going back a bit in time, right? Um, even back in 2019, when FTX first started, there was already, you know, numerous other exchanges all computing for usage and adoption from users and traders alike. So what was then, I guess, the spark or the opportunity that you see in the market that made you decide to start FTX, even, you know, amidst all of those already existing comp um, options and as well as competition? Yeah, there were a lot of existing exchanges, but frankly, most of them weren't built very well. Um, and what we saw was just, uh, you know, a lot of problems in the space. Um, I think a lot of people saw this, but it was everything from, you know, the top derivatives exchanges bleeding a million dollars per day of customer funds um, to not having a competent risk engine um, uh, and, you know, just clawing back from other users. Um, you know, to, you know, you look at the fact that you had to manage, you know, 500 different margin wallets on a single exchange. Uh, because they weren't cross-margining anything. Um, matching engines that were constantly falling over during volatility, uh, lack of uh, well-thought-out compliance programs, and just sort of all over the place, um, a lot of evidence that the uh, that the exchanges weren't living up to what they needed to. Um, and you know, I think a lot of that is that crypto went from a $25 billion industry to a trillion-dollar industry in an extremely short period of time. And so you had all these businesses that were sort of, you know, built up in the smaller era and all of a sudden found themselves trying to shoulder a much larger 
industry and and we're sort of unable to keep up with that i see um and as you said right in the last couple of years crypto has gone from more of like a side industry to something that is you know being recognized worldwide and a lot more yep. with a lot more public eye attention to it in during that time have you seen you know a shift in your user demographics or who the sort of people or, or the occupation of the people who are using your platform be it you know maybe a transition from trader to more a long-term investors or something like that yeah we have seen a little bit of that i think less than some other places have um you know we are still uh you know way more um we're still sort of like way heavier on power users than a lot of other venues are um and you know i think that's a function of the fact that we were late to the game and so we don't you know we haven't had as much time to build up the name recognition um but we're also uh you know i think we've built a great product which the you know users who use the product as much you know as, as much as some of these do appreciate the most um, we have seen still some shift towards long-term investors and towards more people entering the space. Um, but I, I still think that relative to uh, to other venues, we're probably still more uh, you know substantially uh, uh, heavier on the power users rather than sort of the retail consumer base. I see. And on the shift that you mentioned, right? Um, I'm just curious, do you think that's a shift specific to people using FTX? Or is that a sign of the how the people entering the uh, these sort of people entering entering and trading crypto is moving in general? You know, frankly, I think it's some of both. Um, you know, we do see a fair number of users transferring to FTX from other platforms, um, but uh, you know, we also do see a fair number uh, entering the space for the first time and using FTX. And you know, I think that. Uh, uh, I, I really do think that 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 it is a mixture of those, and you know I don't think that's true for all venues. I think that you know if you look at at you know a place like Coinbase, I think they're doing absolutely spectacularly at getting uh, new users in 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 this space, and I think that's probably where you know the biggest bulk of theirs have come from. Yes. And you have said recently said on CNBC, right? I think it was only just a couple of days ago that you feel that the rest of the world is moving in slow motion while you're moving at a reasonable pace. Yep. Um, what do you think is the reason behind this that maybe sets you apart from both your competition and maybe other or the world in general? Yeah, it's a good question. And you know, partially it's a hard question to answer because um, you know, partially we're sort of here trying to understand what's going on and, and a little bit confused, but in, in other companies, but you know, my general sense here is that I, there's a lot of things that, that lead to this. Um, one of them is, you know, when you look at, uh, at sort of the internal coherence of some of these companies, it, it's a little bit of a mess. And, and, you know, what you see is, is, um, you know, it's not clear who is going to be doing what um, you get things caught up in committee after committee after committee. Uh, you have sort of too many cooks in the kitchen. You have the wrong people working on the wrong things um, and um, and not enough people taking responsibility and, you know, making fucking sure that the important things get get done no matter what. Um, and, and so I think it's this paradox where you grow out your your sort of employee base a lot to try and expand capacity uh, but somehow you actually end up with less capacity than you had before because what you lost along the way was the you know cooperation and coherence and, and communication internally i think that's one piece of it you know i also think i mean we we tend to to you know frankly work work decently hard and and i think you know try to hire people who really care about what we're doing and about our product and about delivering an excellent experience to our users and and really not feeling satisfied um, if we're not really trying not to settle for less. And, um, you know, I think that's true at some other places, but I think it's, you know, it's sort of varying how much that's true. Gotcha. And on the advantages, right, and on the point where you say that knowing what the users want, um, before you started FCS, right, you already have already started Alameda Research, which was one of the big, biggest players in the space. Do you think having experience in that um, industry for in terms of trading and all of that gives you a um, 
possibly give you an advantage over you know other people starting their own exchanges or even you know already established players in terms of both the both the vision and the let's say the features or what knowing what the users want in general yeah i think it helped that uh, you know we had a pretty good sense of where the pain points were in a pretty large amount of detail in terms of feeling like this is exactly the thing that is very frustrating this is the other way that you could structure the product that would really help a lot and i think that that you know if you don't have that sense yourself you can try and get it by listening to your users and we do try and do that when we don't have it ourselves but it is so much harder than if you have that base instinct yourself um you know to parse everything that needs to be parsed and so i i, I really do think that like it was a pretty huge advantage Definitely. And on the partnership side, right, moving back to recent events, um, FTX has been more or less on like a partnership spree with various deals, such as with Tom Brady, GSM, yep. and as well as the Miami Heat. I couldn't help but notice that, you know, most of these deals are either US-based and either revolve around, you know, esports or sports. Is there a particular reason behind those two choices? Or in general, is there any specific demographics that FTX or you, you yourself are trying to target with these uh, partnerships? Yeah, totally. So, you know, I, I do think that one thing worth knowing is like FTX was late to the game. FTX US was later to the game. And, you know, it wasn't founded until 2020. Um, and so it has a lot of catch up work to do in terms of name recognition. And, and so I think that some of this really is about getting our name out there in the States. Um, where, you know, FTX has had a, a pretty small footprint historically. Um, I think that's one piece of it. And and the other thing I'll say is I think that sports, you know, and, and esports are one of the few things that tens of millions of people feel really passionately about. And and that can really, um, you know, strike a chord and, and, and be meaningful and um, and motivating to, to a very large number of people. And so I think it seemed like a, a pretty large, um, you know, large target demographic for us to work with. I see. And looking at this uh, centralized exchange space as a whole now, um, how do you see this space evolving and changing in, let's say, the next couple of years or the next one to two years? In terms of, uh, sorry, in terms of DeFi or in terms of like uh, decentralization of other pieces or? Um, I think just, you, you know, like in terms of you know the players involved or the direction that yeah. the exchanges will be focusing on and all of that. Yeah. So I don't know for sure, but you know, I think that the 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 clearest part of this is moving away from an unregulated industry and towards a licensed industry. And that's been sort of the clear direction of many global regulators as crypto has gotten bigger. And more important, um, you know, I think the tricky thing, frankly, is when you find uh, you know, regulators that want uh, it to be a licensed activity, but haven't come out with a clear license yet. And I think that's something a lot of regulators are trying to contend with right now, as they sort of frantically try to build out regimes um, for it. Um, but but I do think that 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 is clearly the direction it's going in. Um, you know, I think that uh, there is a lot of institutional volume as well, which is sitting on the sidelines right now, never really has been big in crypto, but that might change. Um, and there's like real reason to think that might change over the next few years. A lot of institutions are looking to get involved. And, um, you know, I'm guessing a number will come in, you know, over the next one to 30 months. It'll be, it'll be a trickle, it'll be a bit by bit. Um, but that's also going to put pressure on the products to meet institutional standards um, and, uh, and the companies to be institutionally friendly. I see. And on the institution side, right? Um, I know that a lot of DeFi protocols are, you know, adapting to um, their expectation of, as you said, institution coming in, be it, you know, um, the RV for institution or Compound just release their own um, version of their protocol as well. With, and from what most expected, right, um, they would most likely enter through basically investment through centralized exchanges, such as FTX or other exchanges first. Do you think that FTX as an exchange would need to do something to similar to these DeFi protocols, as in have a specific version of their, let's say, of their exchange dedicated to institution, or do you think that there's going to be some other sort of um, adapt adaptation going on there? It's an interesting question. It's less clear because the way that centralized exchanges um, 
uh, work are already sort of more uh, hospitable to institutions than DeFi is. Um, and so it's not clear there's going to need to be changes, but there might need to be. And I think the clearest example of this, well, maybe I'll say two. One is compliance. Like it, it, it's, you know, it's going to be very hard to get institutional relationships if you're not able to maintain positive relationships with regulators. I think that's just super crucial. It's something we've put a lot of work and time into. And, you know, I'm throwing for regulators. Uh, you know, listening to this, I, I think the biggest thing I would say is uh, just reach out to us. If you have anything you want to talk about, you know, shoot me an email. Um, and, you know, we can move quickly. We can move to get a license quickly. If one becomes available, we can alter our product. Um, you know, we want to be as responsive as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the other big piece of this, frankly, um, is custody, which I, I think is an open question. The way custody works in traditional finance is most players will store their funds at a third party custodian that basically then vouches for them uh, to the various venues and settlement takes days. In crypto, the norm is that settlement is immediate and happens through the exchanges. And so you could say, okay, well, why don't institutions then go use a, a third party custodian? But that doesn't fully answer the question because, you know, let's say that, you know, some bank uh, is selling Bitcoin and they're using a third party custodian and they sell it, you know, on FTX uh, to some individual user who is looking to, who buys a Bitcoin and is interfacing directly with FTX and then 30 seconds later requests a withdrawal of that Bitcoin. But the Bitcoin in this hypothetical is with the third party custodian. Not and, and if you allow 30 second withdrawals, it's sort of made, maybe that's defeating the point of the custodian. But if you don't, are you missing settlement? Do you have to like borrow it? Like, is you know, and, and, and so when you try and glue these systems together, you reach some awkward points. And I think it's not totally clear uh, how this is going to be resolved. I think it's going to be kind of herky jerky for a while as, as both sides try to negotiate this out and figure out how to interface with each other. And on, you know, both regulations and institution working with, you know, exchanges as well as DeFi, um, there has been a lot of news, you know, regarding uh, numerous exchanges having been a lot under a lot of scrutiny from regulators across different jurisdictions. With that, I'm curious to hear FTS and your own personal stance on this and what you think of the regulation situation around crypto in general. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's getting more, more regulated, more licensed. You know, our default is we want to get a license if we can. If there's a license um, that that fits our business, we'll absolutely try to apply for it. We're applying for a large number of them in, in a number of jurisdictions right now. And um, that that's our first choice by far. If there isn't one, uh, we'll try to comply with everything that, that we can sort of find. And, um, and, you know, above all else, you know, maintain a really open door for regulators. And, you know, if they have questions um, or comments or concerns, you know, we aim to be really, really responsive and fast um, at addressing them. And, you know, I, I think we've done a, a pretty decent job of this so far. Um, and, um, you know, make it clear that we want to work with them. And, uh, you know, we're going to uh, to be communicative and cooperative. And, um, and that, you know, the thing we'd like the most, frankly, is to work with them to build out regulatory regimes for, um, as, especially for crypto derivatives. I think that's the piece where this comes up the most, because as some jurisdictions start to roll out spot exchange uh, regulations, almost none have actually rolled out comprehensive crypto derivatives licenses or regulations. That's one of the biggest missing pieces right now. I see. And moving away from CFI towards more DeFi now, and with the rise of projects such as you know Solana and as well as sidechains and L2 being more of a thing and, and all enabling on-chain order books as well as limit orders, both of which you know previously are only mostly associated to centralized exchanges. Um, how do you see the dynamics and adoption between centralized exchanges and DEXs evolving in in the future? I yeah, so um, I think that there is a lot more territory that DEXs can cover as they get faster. When you had 10 transactions a second on the blockchain, it was hopeless. Um, frankly, I think it's still hopeless on most faster chains because most of them get up to a thousand 
TPS or maybe 5,000. And that's still not enough. Um, FTX alone uses way more than that. And, and that's the number that they have for the entire network put together, not just like one exchange. Um, but I think if you can scale up to a million TPS, all of a sudden, you do have the capacity to really host a high powered exchange on chain. Um, it's never going to take over the whole world because there are fundamental computational limitations really on DeFi. Um, if you want any geographically decentralized consensus mechanism, uh, light has to travel around the world to confirm a block. Uh, you know, in order for like literally the information to travel from one validator to another, that takes about 100 milliseconds. So anything where 100 milliseconds is too much latency is going to be a, a bad fit for DeFi. And then you also need to be paying, you know, realistically thousands of times the compute cost in many cases, because you you have thousands of independent nodes, each very you know, computing and verifying the blockchain. And so anything that is very data intensive or very computationally intensive um, is also going to be you know very expensive to run on chain. Now that doesn't mean you can't come close to that. And as an example, if you're building a decentralized social media system, it's very, very hard to put a video on chain. It's just too much data. But you can certainly put a link, you know, to to like a YouTube link to a video on chain. And then people could follow that link to the centralized server that holds the video, or you could use something like Arweave or 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 you know Filecoin or you know one of the various um, sort of like uh, you know side chain storage systems um, to try and implement that. So there, that that doesn't preclude you know any businesses that touch high intense uh, intensity products from having some parts which are decentralized, some parts which are on chain. Um, but you know I, there there's a, a you know some territories probably never going to cover. But there's some that it absolutely could. And I think that you know part of this is you just absolutely need to move to, to much faster chains. And I think very, very few chains are fast enough right now. Um, and second, you need great user experiences. And right now, I think, frankly, DeFi is pretty mediocre user experiences. And uh, that's going to take just a lot of you know blood and sweat to, to improve. I see. And as you said, right, there are definitely some industries or some sectors that DeFi still more or less dominates in terms of you know the user experience as well as the capabilities right but yeah. on the other hand um do you think that there's any sector of the market that you think the uh a pro let's say a protocol on DeFi is maybe already working better than their centralized equivalent or no will definitely be in not. the near future um in in the future i think there probably will be but definitely not right now um i think that like social media could be um, I think sort of consumer facing financial applications um, that are sort of not super latency sensitive could be. Um, I, I don't think they are yet, but but I, I think that they there's no technological reason they couldn't if people grow, you know, just built really great products. And going on from that, you said that there is no technical reasons that why it couldn't get there, right? What do you think is the main, let's say, barrier between what is the situation now and and what it would the potential that DeFi have? First of all, way too many people are, are, are building on chains that just absolutely will not scale enough. And just like nothing's gonna fix that. Um, but second of all, um, you know, if you look at sort of the effort that goes into building out a lot of C5 products, it's it's big. Um, that sort of effort just isn't being put into DeFi products. Like it just isn't. And you know, you look at sort of like the biggest DeFi projects which have generally like 10 person teams. And we tried to keep our company as small as possible, you know, not as small as possible, but you know, small, smaller than, than many others do in terms of workforce. We're way, you know, we're a factor of 50 smaller than many of our competitors. We still have, you know, over a hundred people at this point. And, um, you know, it's like, there's that scale, um, you know, the amount of iteration that we do on our products, we are constantly tweaking them. Um, you just don't see that in DeFi nearly as much right now. Um, it, it just, you know, these don't look like, um, you know, uh, like frankly, there's there's a pretty big difference between the best run and highest powered sort of companies in the world and what you see with a lot of the DeFi projects. Again, that doesn't mean they can't get there. And it doesn't mean they won't get there very soon. Um, but it's it's a lot of work to build a world class uh, user experience and product. Definitely, and 
do you think you know the difference in let's say the mentality between the teams and how product is treated do you have any let's say what are your personal thoughts on the reason behind that because from what i see right there's a lot of people that say that DeFi is able to iterate then fast a lot faster than traditional companies but in your opinion but that seemed to be there seemed to be a discrepancy between that and your opinion so i wanted to hear your thoughts a bit on that so the way in which DeFi is super powered um is that you can iterate quickly on what other people have built so the really amazing thing about building on DeFi is if someone else builds an application and you're building on the same chain, you can compose with it. And you can build out your application that incorporates theirs as if it was native. And you just can't do that nearly as well in C5. That's really fucking powerful. Now, that only is very powerful once you start to have a few very, very good applications. It sort of doesn't help you get the first great application, but you can get exponential growth of them once you start. Um, and so you trace back to like, what's the biggest blocker on getting the first one? Again, a lot of the manpower is going to change. It just provably will not scale. And it's just like that it's a dead end. Um, but also, uh, uh, it's hard to have a decentralized workforce. Like many of these aren't companies. And, 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 and you know, it, it's, I don't know, there, there's, it, it, it's a hard problem, I think. It's not unsolvable, but you need the right leadership. You need the right communication. You need the right community. Um, and that's not easy to do when you're trying to build a beautiful coherent product as opposed to like a mass market phenomenon and and i think that's something which like it's not unsolvable um but you're you're just sort of like doing it with your hands tied behind your back like you know it's you're playing on really hard mode um when you're trying to build up you know a team to work on a DeFi protocol um without any centralization and there's a lot of power that comes with it, but it's 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 not easy. Definitely agree. And to close off, right, I have a few more personal questions that I am curious about. Um, from what I understand, right, you're a strong proponent of the effective altruism movement. Can you perhaps explain briefly to us what that is and what draws you to it in the first place? Yeah. So you know, what sort of started out with was, you know, let's say you're going to donate a hundred dollars. Um, where should you donate it to save the most lives? And so it looked at, you know, developing world health charities found that, you know, for some single digit number of thousands of dollars, on average, you could save someone from dying of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. And there, there are a number of other sort of similar uh, interventions. Um, and what it's branched out to over time is, you know, what should you do with your life to maximize the amount of positive impact you can have on the world? And that could mean a lot of different things. It could mean a lot of causes to support, and it could mean a lot of things to do with your life, whether, you know, we're doing what I'm doing, which is, you know, earning to give, trying to, to make what I can to be able to donate it to, to, you know, hopefully super effective causes or working directly to build out, um, you know, charities and movements and organizations to support um, and implement really effective change. And so uh, that that's sort of like the basic uh, theory behind it. Awesome. Um, unfortunately, I think that's all the time I have we have for today. Um, thank you very much, Sam, for all the insight that you give. And I could, I have a lot more questions that I would love to ask you, but perhaps on another occasion. Thank you. Yep.